Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm going to begin a brand new series talking about the power of faith-filled words. And I am really excited to be sharing on this. You know, back in the beginning of my ministry, this is one of the teachings that I... Uh, used to teach on a lot, and I had an entire series talking about the creative power of words, but that's been like 30-something years ago, maybe 35 years ago. And I recently was in one of our uh, Bible college classes, and I just made a comment about how powerful words were and the things that you say. And I made this comment in passing, and after the uh, class was over, I had a student come up and say, do you have a series on this? And I said, well, I used to have a series on it 30-something years ago. And I said, it's so old that we don't even reproduce it anymore. And he says, you need to put out a whole series on this again. And so I got to thinking about that, and I thought, you know, I do, because I refer to this a lot. If you've heard my teaching on the authority of the believer, you've heard me teach about this. If you've heard my teaching on um, faith builders, you've heard me teach about this. If you've heard my teaching on you've already got it, you've heard me teach about this. I talk about it, but I haven't just uh, gone back and, and taught uh, extensively just on the subject of how powerful our words are. And so recently, uh, in, uh, when I was in England, back in 2011, I did an entire series on this during our Grace and Faith Conference over there in England. And I tell you, it was powerful. And we saw a lot of miracles happen. And this is one of the keys. And I know that just by the topic that I'm describing, many of you are going to say, oh, you know, your words, because we don't put an importance on our words. We certainly don't put an importance on other people's words. And we listen to things that we shouldn't be listening to. And most people do not understand the power of words. Even most Christians who say that they understand the power of the words, you can tell by listening to them that they don't. And so I'm, I'm saying these things by way of introduction, saying that I know many of you are going, oh, the power of faith-filled words again, and I've already heard this, or I'd like to hear something different. And if that's your reaction, then I can promise you, you do not have the revelation on this because this is powerful and it has a potential of really changing your life. You know, before our meetings, I usually stand out in, uh, the, in the crowd for at least an hour. And we have people come, and I visit with them. Many of them want prayer. And I just don't have time to teach everybody all of these things. And so I'm not always uh, able to tell them or explain these things to them. And so many times, I'll just go ahead and pray for them. But I know that they aren't going to receive the healing that they desire because of the words that they say. The words that you say just show me volumes of what's in your heart. We recently have a situation where somebody had to be dealt with and I was meeting with my staff. I was kind of giving them some instructions of how I would talk to this person. And, and one of the things that I told them, I said, you know, you just tell them the situation and then you listen. I said, don't uh, go in with a preconceived idea. You listen to what they have to say and how they respond. And if they go to trying to justify themselves, if they respond in anger, if they do this and this and this, I said, words tell a lot about what's on the inside of a person's heart. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And your mouth will say what's in your heart. Now, you can be a hypocrite and you can lie, and you can say things contrary to what's truly in your heart on a brief period of time. But if you just listen to a person, the dominant thing that comes out of their mouth is going to betray what's in their heart. And as we get further into this series, I hesitate to say this now because some of you might just disagree with this and blow it off and uh, not even listen to the series because you think this isn't important. But as we get further into this series, I am going to show you that uh, out of your heart, though, if you could sit down and honestly, objectively analyze the words that you're saying, it would tell you volumes about where you are in your relationship with God. 
And again, I know that there's many of you just say, oh, that's not true. You don't understand my problems over here. You don't understand the creative power of faith-filled words. And so what I want to do is to share some things with you about how important your words are. And this is really how you release the power of God in your life. Uh, the power and the authority that we use is God-given. It comes from God. That means it's not your power. It's God's power, and it operates according to His laws, according to the way He does things, and you can't sit there and just say, well, I don't like this, and th I'm not going to do things this way, and here's how I believe it's going to be done. The real power in the Christian life is a gift from God. It's His indwelling power, and it's going to have to operate according to His laws, and I'm going to be teaching you as we talk about the power of faith-filled words how His kingdom operates. And you will find out that the vast majority of us as Christians, people who are watching this program, and the extreme vast majority of non-Christians and all of this secular world and the things that we are being taught and uh, plugged into on a daily basis, they are operating contrary to what God said in His Word. And if you are plugged into this, it is going to defeat you. And so this is not a matter of you just saying, well, I reject this. I think I'll do it another way. There is no other way for God's power to operate. One of the things I'm going to show you through the Word of God is that this is how God operates. And if you are going to see God flow through you in His power, work in your life, you're going to have to adopt His way of doing things. And this is how God functions. Let me just start over here in Mark chapter 11. I'm going to come back to this and teach on this in more detail, so this isn't going to be an in-depth teaching on this. But I just want to make this point, use this as an illustration. We'll go to some other scriptures and begin to show you about how God has operated through the power of words. And I'll come back to this and go into much more detail. But in the 11th chapter of the book of Mark is an instance where Jesus, right at the end of his ministry... This is his last uh, time, not the very last instance that he was in Jerusalem, but during that last week, the Passover week, uh, that he was there ministering. And he was going into Jerusalem, and as he was walking into the city, he was staying at Bethany, and as he was walking into the city of Jerusalem, he was hungry. And he saw a fig tree that had leaves, but it didn't have any fruit on it. And, uh, you know, li uh, fig trees... I've had some people challenge this, and there are different types of fig trees, but I actually had a person who is a member, uh, I'm not sure the exact name of it, but it's some kind of a, a government agency in Israel verify that the fig trees in Israel produce figs at the same time or right before the leaves come out. So if there are leaves on a fig tree in Israel, it should have figs. It wasn't time for the figs yet, but it wasn't time for leaves. And this tree already had leaves on it. And so Jesus went to this fig tree, fig tree expecting to get some fruit off of it. When he got there, it had leaves, but it didn't have any figs. And so he cursed this fig tree. And like I said, I'll go into this in more detail. And some people think, well, how could he have done this? Well, he's the creator. He's the one that created these fig trees. He's the one that told them how they were supposed to operate. And this fig tree was a pervert. This fig tree was not operating the way that God created it to. And Jesus, as the creator, had every right to kill this fig tree because it was not operating according to the way that he created it to. That is a powerful truth, and there's a lot of things that could be said about that. But anyway, the way he did this, he just cursed it. He didn't take any salt and put on it. He didn't cut it down. He didn't dig it up. He didn't break off a limb. He didn't do anything in the natural to cause this. But here's what he did in verse 14, Mark 11:14. He said, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And it makes special mention in that verse that it says his disciples heard it. And so they went on into the city of Jerusalem. They came back that evening. We don't know for sure, but it would be uh, consistent to think that they took the same road, that they passed the exact same fig tree that evening. Nobody said anything about it that evening. But the next morning, 
it says in verse 20, And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. If you read this same instance over in Matthew's account, over there it says that when Jesus spoke to this fig tree that anon or immediately it died. And yet, you read here, it was the next morning that they saw that the fig tree was dried up. What's the, how do you balance those? Was it instantly or did it take 24 hours? Well, the answer is it was dried up from the roots. It died immediately. Instantly, the roots were dead. And it just took a period of time for what had happened below the surface that was unobservable to manifest in the leaves that were above the surface. You know, this is similar to if you cut off a rose or a flower. You can put it in a vase and put it in water and it'll still look beautiful and it'll hold its uh, uh, color and, and it won't wilt for maybe a week or two weeks, depending on what, how you take care of it. But the moment you sever it from that plant, it's dead. And it just takes a period of time for that death to manifest itself in the flower. Likewise, the moment Jesus spoke, he didn't touch it, he didn't do anything in the natural, but the moment he spoke, that fig tree was dead, and it took a period of time for what had taken place in the roots to manifest itself in the leaves and in the portion of that uh, fig tree that was above ground. And so here's Peter's response in verse 21. Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. You know, we don't have the benefit of hearing the inflection of Peter's voice. And sometimes we just read this in a monotone and we, we don't catch this. But I can guarantee you that Peter didn't just say, Master, the fig tree that you cursed is withered away. <laughs> I believe he was overwhelmed. It was more like, Jesus, look at this fig tree. You cursed it. You just spoke to it, and it's dead. He was absolutely shocked. And here's Jesus' answer in verse 22. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Have faith in God. And we don't have the benefit of hearing Jesus' inflection of his voice either, but I don't believe he just said, Have faith in God, Peter. No, it was more like, Peter, have faith in God. What's wrong with you? Don't you understand the power that I have? Why are you shocked to see this fig tree withered away? This reaction, most people would think, man, Peter was really in tune with God and he was impressed with the things of God. But what it really did, it revealed the unbelief that was in his heart. He was shocked to see a miracle happen without anything physical taking place. It was all just Jesus spoke words out of his mouth and he was shocked by this. And did you know likewise, it shocks people today to understand the power of our words. But Jesus said, have faith in God. You ought to be able to believe and see things like this happen. And then he gave an explanation of how he was able to do this miracle on the fig tree. In verse 23, he says, For verily I say unto you that whosoever... Man, that is a powerful statement right there. This means it's not uh, based on your gender. It's not based on your education. It's not based on your holiness. It's not based on any of these natural things. Many times people will listen to somebody teach on this, use an example about Jesus and Peter, and they'll say, oh, those people were different than me. They were a whosoever. Peter was a whosoever. All of these disciples were whosoever. You are a whosoever. I am a whosoever. This is not just for people that were 2,000 years ago. This will work for people right now. In our modern age, this still works. Whosoever will say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. There are three times in this verse that Jesus talked about the power of words. He says, Whosoever shall say, unto this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Three times he emphasizes the power of words. So here's Peter just shocked, overwhelmed at this miracle. And again, I think sometimes we miss 
how impressive this was. But if we were just walking down the street, and if I looked up at a tree, and I said, you're dead, and that's all I said, and we just walked on, and then the next day we were walking by, and if that tree was all dried up, and you could tell that it had died overnight, and all I had done is talk to it, I guarantee you that would be impressive. You'd be probably saying, look at the fig tree that you cursed, just like Peter did. And Jesus is explaining how it happened. He just spoke words. I know that there are some of you watching this program right now that are thinking, it's not this, you can't do this with words. Well, then just cut this instance out of your Bible because this is what it's all based on. And I'm going to be linking many other scriptures to this. And if you really get into the words, you're going to find out that your words are powerful, super powerful. But notice here, it's not only words. You have to believe that the things that you say come to pass. And this is why most of us aren't seeing the power of our words really affect things in a positive way the way we should. It's because we don't believe it. We have just gotten to where we think words are unimportant. You can prove that by the way that people listen to doubt and unbelief of other people. They will sit in churches. I quit preaching now and I'm gone to prying. I'm talking directly to some of you that are in churches that are deader than a hammer. Man, I was in a church one time that a person died and they called the 911, the emergency number, and the rescue people came and they carried out half of the congregation before they found the dead person. That's how dead that church was. There are some of you that are in dead churches. I mean, if a person lifts their hand to praise God, they'll say it's down the hall on the left, first door on the left. I mean, that you couldn't praise God. There aren't people there. It's just dead. And you listen to preaching that is not benefiting you. It's speaking doubt and unbelief because you do not believe the power of words. And some of you might think, oh, well, I wouldn't ever say any of these things. Let me share this passage with you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 30. Three, it says, be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Man, that is a strong statement right there. It's saying, don't be deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. The word communications here is not only limited to words. This is talking about a lifestyle, a way of living. You can communicate with more than words. You can communicate with actions. You can communicate in a lot of different ways, but evil communications includes the words that you say, and it corrupts good manners. You know, if you take a rotten apple and put it up next to a good apple, the good apple doesn't change the rotten apple. It's the rotten apple that will change the good apple. It seems like that in our fallen world, everything goes from a state of good to bad, a state of order to disorder. And unbelief and doubt tends to influence and affect good uh, manners, people with uh, good intentions and stuff. And this says, don't be deceived. If you're saying that, oh, I can watch this movie, I can... I can uh, be involved in this church. I can have this circle of friends that they're all ungodly and everything they're saying and doing is bad and yet it doesn't affect me. You're deceived. That's about as blunt as I can put that. You're deceived because the Bible says don't be deceived. Uh, evil communications corrupt good manners. You could turn over to Second Peter chapter 2. I'm running short of time today. Maybe I'll go into more depth on this tomorrow. But in 2 Peter chapter 2, it talks about um, Lot, and it calls him a righteous man in seeing and hearing their evil communications. He vexed his soul from day to day. And he wound up, he didn't lose his faith in God. He still had faith in God, but it cost him everything. He went down to Sodom and Gomorrah, because of the financial benefit and the lush pasture and it was good for his cattle and his sheep and things like this. And he did it for a monetary reason, but he wound up losing his family, his wife, his daughters. It cost him everything. He just barely escaped with his life because of the evil communications of other people. 
And I tell you, there are many people that are listening to me as I give this introduction, talking about how powerful our words are, and you're just sitting here downplaying this and saying, oh, it's not that important, and it really doesn't matter what I listen to. And uh, you're, you're discounting this, and you're doing the same thing that Lot did to himself. I guarantee you it's going to harden you. It's going to harden your kids. It's going to harden your wife. It's going to harden other people. It's going to cost you. The, the power of words is not only your words, but it's every word you hear. Right now, you're hearing faith-filled words that line up with the Word of God, things that can benefit you and help you. But that's not all you listen to. You listen to the news. You watch movies. You watch TV shows. You read magazines. You read books. You do all kinds of things. And every word, not only every word that you speak, but every word that comes to you is either life or death. It's either building you up or tearing you down. And if you say, but I can endure this. It's not that big of a deal. I reject it. I, I, it doesn't bother me. Then according to 1 Corinthians 15, 33, you are deceived because evil communications corrupt good manners. You cannot indulge yourself. You cannot let the sewage of this world flow through you without it affecting you. Something is going to stick. Something is going to happen to you. And I tell you, as we go through this series and talk about the power of faith-filled words, I believe it's going to give you an impetus to start using your words and speaking faith-filled words, but it's also going to show you that you need to protect your heart and you don't need to expose yourself to the doubt and the unbelief. You may not be able to avoid it 100%, but we could avoid a lot of it. The majority of it, uh, we could change our situation easily if we just understood how powerful our words are. And so I'm beginning this series to talk about the power of faith-filled words. And I want to just once again go back to Mark 11:23 and say that Jesus said this is how he performed his miracle, this miracle on the fig tree. And you will find it in many other places. Matter of fact, when he talked to the centurion in Matthew chapter 8, the reason he marveled at this man's faith is because this man says, I don't need to have you come here. I don't have to see you touch him. You speak the word only. And he marveled at this man's faith because of a person understood the power of faith-filled words. I tell you, this is a key to walking with God and understanding the things of God, and I've got a lot to share about it. So I encourage you to listen in and to make a priority on getting hold of these truths. I've also got this teaching, and this is a brand new teaching. It's the first time I've taught this as a series in something like 35 years. So I've got this brand new teaching entitled, The Power of Faith-Filled Words. We have a CD set, we have a DVD set, as seen on TV, and we also have a live DVD set where I taught this over in the UK. And if you'll listen, our announcer is going to give you more information about how you can get these materials. I encourage you to call or write today and then join me again tomorrow as we continue this teaching on the power of faith-filled words.